Good evening. Thank you all so much for coming to our series. Tonight we're going to do Revelation chapter 18. And this is an awesome, awesome chapter. Um, what you will notice, I mean, it's awesome how God designed everything. God has a plan and he sets his word up, the Bible, so that we can be able to understand and to give us an example of how we need to be living in the last days. Like I told you all, the book of Daniel or Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are perfect examples of God's people living in Babylon. Living in Babylon. Okay? Daniel is supposed to be a representation of God's people in the last days. I really believe that. So tonight we're going to find out how Babylon fell. Okay? And then we're going to see it in Revelation chapter 18. And it's going to be so similar that there's no doubt that God was giving, an, giving us an example of how Belteshazzar, who was Daniel, was the representative in God, of God's people in today's day. I needed to share this verse with you all. Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. It is awesome. It says, Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. So here is Jesus. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And John is crying. He's, he's in anguish because nobody can open these seals. There was nobody found that was nobody on earth who was worthy enough. But it says that Jesus was worthy enough. Amen. And we see how he is victorious. So first of all, we're going to look at the book of um, Daniel chapter 5. In Daniel chapter 5, we find this. First of all, it says, Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines, concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of silver, of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. So what we find here is something that's very interesting. This is Belshazzar. Belshazzar was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. You all remember how Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2 had been shown by God to, of the things that were going to happen in the future. It's awesome how God picked what we would have considered a pagan, a heathen, and told him, showed him what was going to happen with earth's history. You know, um, God isn't a discriminator of race. God isn't a discriminator of, of uh, sex. God isn't a discriminator of age. God will use anybody who is willing to listen to him. And we find, we find that, that later on in Daniel uh, chapter 4, we find Nebuchadnezzar's transformation. And we see a little bit here. Um, I'll go ahead and open my Bible to Daniel chapter 5. I don't have some of the ver these verses um, on the PowerPoint presentation. But we find in Daniel chapter 5 where essentially uh, Belshazzar, who is a king or the grandson of, of Nebuchadnezzar, is having this great feast. And it's ridiculous because, let me ask you all a question. How many of you all would be having a great feast? Let's say you're the president or the king of a, of a country. Okay, and you're at war. And the country that you're at war with is not just some laughing matter. And yeah, your capital city may have three layers of walls, each 100 feet tall, wide enough that horses could run all the way around it. Yeah, you had the mighty Euphrates River flowing through the middle of it, and you had plenty of food. But how many of y'all would be having a great big party or festival? It's kind of ridiculous, isn't it? And you all remember how in Daniel chapter 7, the lion who represented Babylon, it says that it was at first, uh, Daniel sees him as a lion, and it has wings, eagle's wings, it says. But then it says that its eagle's wings were plucked off. And then it says that the lion stood up like a man and walked like a man. And then it goes as far as saying that his heart, the heart of that lion, was ripped out, and it, in its place was given the heart of a man. What we see is the transformation that Babylon had, where it was as mighty as the king of the jungle that had the, the wings of the king of the birds. I mean, it was king, and all of a sudden, all of those things that made it so powerful, all of those things that made it so prestigious, everything changes, and it becomes just a common man. Who would win? A lion, you know, one of us, not Samson, <laughs> but who would win in a fight? A lion or one of us, one of us men? Who would be willing to do that? Would you, Wayne, go face to face with a lion like the one I showed there? Or Sammy? Do what? Just, just your bare hands. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't even do it, huh? It gives you chills. I remember we, had a Fort, we were at the Fort Worth Zoo, and uh, we were with our, with our youth pastor. This was when I was a kid. And this lion started howling. 
or roaring. Sorry, wrong expression. And I mean, it gave you chills. Brian must have been about 30, 40 yards away from us. And I mean, he was on all fours and just, you know, roaring. And you could feel the vibration on your feet. And I was thinking to myself, this little river here, that's not going to stop the lion from jumping across and eating me. I got out of there pretty quick. <laughs> so it says that this lion who had eagle's wings are plucked off. He's made to stand up and the heart of a man is given to it. We find that here. We find where Belshazzar, this foolish and re just dumb grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, is the king now. Instead of being out there fighting with his men, instead of preparing for war, he's having this great big feast. All of his important people are there. But then the big mistake that he made, what messed him up was that he took the holy things of God and mocked them and used them to worship his gods. Okay? <laughs> kind of like the little horn. Speaks blasphemies against God. Uses the holy things of God for common things of men. That's what's going on here. So Belshazzar is essentially mocking God, is mocking the God of the Jews. He remembers that his grandpa had, had conquered the Jews and taken everything out of the temple and brought them to Babylon. But even his own grandfather who had conquered the Jews didn't use the holy things of God for his own purpose. But here is this guy and he's, I'm sorry, he's just a complete moron. He's ruling the kingdom, taking it to the ground. It's a sad thing. And it just, <laughs> we'll see what happens. So in verse 5 it says, In the same hour, everybody's all having a great time. Everybody's drunk and, and being gluttonous and stuff. And you, know, just, you can just imagine the revelry and the, the embarrassing things that must have been happening. It says, In the same hour. The fingers of a man, man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw part of the hand that wrote. So what happens is that as, as uh, Belshazzar is having this great big party, as Belshazzar is drunk with all of his friends and all of his concubines, and they're just, it's a sinful place, it's a sinful state, it's full of confusion. As all of this is going on, it says all of a sudden, a man's hand starts to write on the wall. <laughs> that would sober you up real quick, wouldn't it? It begins to write on the wall, and all of a sudden, all the music stops. All of a sudden, all the laughing stops. All of a sudden, all the drinking stops. People are dropping their glasses. People are probably passing out because something that is supernatural has just happened. There is essentially a judgment scene that is going on, and these people didn't even know it. God begins to write on the wall. It's interesting because when we look at the Bible, when we study right before a major catastrophe happens, it says that God goes and sees for himself. When in, uh, what was it? If I'm not mistaken, it's Genesis chapter 18 or 19. I don't have the, the, the scripture right in front of me. But when the three messengers came to Abraham, it says that two of them continued on into, continued on into Sodom and Gomorrah. Why do you think that they went? And the third one came back and, or stayed with Abraham and began to talk to him. He says, I have heard their cries. I want to see essentially what he's saying. I want to see for myself how evil that place is. Before uh, the flood, God himself also wanted to see. When the Tower of Babel, the foundation of Babylon, it says God himself saw. So he sees the evil. God doesn't take somebody's word for it. How do you say it? You go straight to the horse's mouth? Is that the right expression? God goes straight to the, to the horse's mouth. <laughs> God goes straight to the horse's mouth to see if it's true. What we have here is a judgment scene that is happening. God has seen, and we're going to see how we know it's a judgment scene. God has seen that these, these Babylonians, these foolish Babylonians are mocking Him by offering the things that are holy, that are sacred, that belong to God, and using them for the worship of their own gods. So it says that all of a sudden this hand starts to appear, and it says that His loins are, loose, loins are loosened. And then it says that, you know, everybody's panicked, you know, so 
Belshazzar goes and he calls all of his wise men, he calls all of his magicians, his astrologers. It's almost like you're going all the way back to Daniel chapter 2 when his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, called all of his wise men, magicians, and astrologers to come before him and tell him what the dream was. Except for now, Belshazzar is saying, tell me what the writing says, and I will make you third in the kingdom. Third, because he was second. His, we believe that his dad, uh, because of illness, or he might have been in war, we don't know exactly, he was in another place. So he leaves his foolish son there to rule. So they go to try to, they're trying to figure it out. And then all of a sudden, his mother remembers. His mother remembers. I mean, who wouldn't be able to remember a situation like that? Who wouldn't be able to remember a time where her own father went through a similar time where he was just troubled, he was distressed. Everybody, nobody, no, king, no lights in the kingdom were off. Everybody was awake including herself probably as a young girl. And he's, she's probably asking, you know, what's going on? What's going on with Dad? And she probably hears, he had a terrible dream and wants to know what it is about. So it's like, it's like deja vu, because here is the queen mother, and she's seeing her son. She's remembering her, her father, and she says, there was a man. There was a man from, the tra from, the, from Judah, and he was able to interpret that dream. So they go and they find that man. His name, his Babylonian name was Belteshazzar. It's crazy, just the, the irony that happens in this chapter. It's beautiful. Belshazzar, the foolish, the foolish king, in front of Belteshazzar, a man who was brought into Babylon almost as a slave. Belshazzar, the man who mocked God. Belteshazzar, the man who reverenced God and walked in his ways. Belshazzar, the man who is running the kingdom into the ground. And Belteshazzar, who knows the things that are going on in the world he lives in, and I believe he wasn't in this party because they had to go look for him. I believe if we follow Daniel's pattern, I really believe that Daniel was probably praying. So they go and they find Daniel. And Belshazzar tells Belteshazzar, he tells him, Hey, you know what, man? If you can tell me what that writing says, I will make you third in my kingdom. I will give you purple robes. I will make you the richest man. Listen to what Daniel says. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. So Daniel tells Belshazzar, You know what, man? I don't want to be third in kingdom. I don't want, I don't want your riches. I don't want your glory. I don't want it. You can keep it. And you're going to see why in just a little bit. So, Belsh or, you know, Daniel, Belsh Belteshazzar gets after Belshazzar and essentially tells him, your grandfather who had conquered the Jews, he never even dared to mock the God of the Jews. But you are taking the things that are holy and belong to him and you're using them for your own good pleasure. And then he begins to read to him and it says, Mene, mene, tekel, hu, parson. This, this is the interpretation of each word. Many or mene, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persian. So what's going on there is Daniel is interpreting to Belsha Belshazzar. Belteshazzar is telling Belshazzar, you have been counted you have been weighed, you have been found wanting, and the Persians are going to overtake you. I bet that sobered that man right up. Watch what happens. Verse 30 says, That very night, King Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius and Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. So the question I have for you is why in the world would Belshazzar, Daniel, or Belteshazzar, I'm sorry, Daniel, want the kingdom? He knew what was going to happen. <laughs> he said, I don't want your stinking kingdom. I don't want to be third of this almost, but yeah, I don't want to be the third uh, uh, man of importance in Babylon for just two hours. Well, that's just a mockery. Daniel knew what was going to happen. Daniel knew that that very night, the, the city of Babylon would be overthrown. The crazy thing is that the man who overthrew it, Darius or Cyrus, he had been predicted to do it almost a hundred years before it happened. 
That's what's crazy. You know, all these great walls, these three massive layers of walls around Babylon, these, this mighty Euphrates River, all of their soldiers, everybody was drunk. Everybody, nobody was paying attention. And everybody was living for the day. And what Cyrus did was genius. <laughs> they knew that they couldn't besiege the city. That would be impossible. They had plenty of water. They had plenty of food. The army would starve to death before the city of Babylon. So what did they do? They redirected the Euphrates River. And they walked right in through the river. Nobody stopped them. Nobody could stop them. And that very night, Belshazzar died. But Belteshazzar, Daniel, because of his wisdom, because Daniel had been found with God, because Daniel spent time with God, because Daniel knew God and the plans of God and knew that this world is just temporary. Daniel was giving, given asylum, and not just asylum. Daniel was made a powerful man in the following kingdom. I mean, how amazing must Daniel have been that the oncoming kingdom the kingdom that's overthrowing his kingdom, he was a citizen of Babylon, they knew his reputation. You think about that. Darius or Cyrus, they knew the reputation that Daniel had, that this man is a man of wisdom. Where did Daniel get his wisdom from? From God. So they kept him on. They kept him on in this new company. Now let's go to the book of Revelation, chapter 18, verse 2. It's almost like you're taking off right from the same part, huh? It says, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. She has become a dwelling for demons, and a haunt for every impure spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean, detestable animal. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. It's almost like when you're reading here, you're reading exactly what's going on. And the same things that, that um, the reason that Babylon fell, the original Babylon, the actual city of Babylon collapsed, was because of the same things that God or Jesus is telling John that it's going to fall in the future. It's word for word. John, Jesus is speaking to spiritual Babylon. Jesus is speaking to the Babylon that we're living in today. And it's Almost like he could have used those very same words for Belshazzar. Jesus here, essentially he is writing on the wall, telling the citizens of Babylon, telling the people of confusion, telling the people who want to live in revelry, telling the people who want to live in this materialistic world. You have been counted, you have been weighed, and you have been found wanting. But what does Jesus say? First of all, he criticizes the city. But then it says... Jesus tells his people, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues, for her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Who is Jesus speaking to here? Who is Jesus saying, Come out of her, my people? To us. To the people, essentially, we are supposed to be like Daniel. D Daniel is our, our, our goal, I guess you can say. Just like Daniel, when Babylon was in this, you know, this great big party, and all kinds of sin were going on in that party. Where was Daniel? He wasn't in there. He wasn't in that party. He was with God. So when Jesus has, says here to the people, Come out of her, my people, Jesus is essentially speaking to those who are imitators of Daniel, those people who walk with Jesus Christ, those people, like Jesus says to Peter, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. He tells them, always be alert, be watching, because you don't know when the Son of Man is going to return. That's what's going on here. Like Daniel, he was praying, we must also be found praying. We must also be found watching for Jesus' second coming. We don't know when it's going to happen. Jesus himself says it's going to be like a thief in the night. It's going to happen. But when it happens, we don't want to be found in that party. When it happens, we don't want to be found in the sins of Babylon. When it happens, we don't want to be part of the confusion. That's what Babylon is. The whole name, I mean, we even use it today, you know, when somebody's talking or even when, <laughs> when Noah's talking. 
he'll just start rumbling on and he thinks that he knows he's carrying on a conversation with you. The other day I saw him talking to my dad and it's something like, he's moving his hand around and my dad's like, oh, really? And then Noah's just talking. What do you call that? Babbling. Babbling. <laughs> it gets his name from the day that God confused their tongue. It got his name because the people there were confused. They were working for their own effort. They didn't trust God. It was all about salvation by works. They were making, mocking the things that were holy. They were using the things of God for their own pleasure. That's why Jesus says, come out of her, my people. And it's awesome that he calls us his people and that he tells us, if you don't come out, this is what's going to happen. Jesus is essentially saying, I am judging them right now, but you have the opportunity to come out. You don't have to participate in the, the, the plagues and the, the punishment that is going to befall her. In verse 9 and 10, says, The kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her. When they see the smoke of her burning, of her burning, standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. It's almost like Jesus is speaking to the city of Babylon. <laughs> That's what happened. That city was overthrown. It just, it was complete chaos. The royal family, I imagine, was killed. And people were lamenting for this, what, for this city who at that point in time had been the most beautiful city on the face of the earth. The city of Babylon was so beautiful. Nebuchadnezzar had done such an amazing job with Babylon that the Medes and the Persians used it as their capital. The Greeks used it as one of their capitals. In other words, the city of Babylon was so beautiful that it was almost modern enough to remain for centuries as a capital city. But it collapsed. It collapsed because they were... They weren't aware of the things, or they didn't care about the things that were happening. And that's the other thing. Their sin was that they didn't care that they were in the middle of warfare. The reason that some people won't go to heaven is because they won't care that there's a spiritual warfare going on. They know it's happening, but they don't care. Belshazzar knew they were at war. And here's this man. Hey, let's just get drunk. Let's just have a good time here. They didn't, he didn't care. The people that don't go to heaven isn't because Jesus doesn't want to save them. Jesus wants to save everyone, like Peter says. They're not saved because they don't care. They're not saved because they don't want to be with Jesus. That's why Daniel tells Belshazzar, he tells him, you knew your grandfather. You knew that essentially that your grandfather knew who God was, but you didn't care. Daniel must have been angry. <laughs> Daniel must have been furious because although Babylon was a wicked city, Daniel still had a major part in the fact that Babylon was a, a powerful city. Daniel also helped to make Babylon a powerful city. And now he's following the lead of this dumb man. I mean, there's, I'm sorry, there's just really no other way to put it. <laughs> Revelation chapter 15, verse 15 and 16, it says, The merchants of these things who became rich by her, will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. It collapses. It's going to collapse. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found any more. This is a picture that I found on, online. We find here the candlesticks that belong to God. <laughs> What's interesting is that we find a serpent here. I believe that's the artist's rendition of, of Satan telling the, the people who are observing this art piece of artwork that Satan had a major part of it. And the writing's happening over here, the Tower of Babel, the, the towers for their gods, and the people are all shocked. It was a terrible time. But Revelation chapter 18, 18, verse 24 says, And in her was found the blood of the prophets and saints, and of all who were slain on the earth. 
You see, the city of Babylon, the original city of Babylon that conquered the, the tribe of Judah, the nation of Judah, they killed so many people. Yes, a lot of the people, of the citizens of Judah had left God and they were worshiping other gods, but there were still faithful people like Daniel, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There were still faithful people in Judah like Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, who were trying to call God's people back to the worship of the one true God. The remnant. That's exactly right, Pastor Joe. And here we find it says, this city of Babylon, just like it did back then where it's laid God's people, in the future as well, spiritual Babylon, which is Babylon again is confusion. Babylon is, is the mocking of God. Babylon is not trusting in God and doing things for your, on your own behalf. They also will persecute God's people. Remember how I said that in Revelation chapter 13, that there is a sea beast, essentially that was being used by Satan. It was just a, a puppet in Satan's hand, essentially to obtain the worship that he wanted. And then it says that the land beast comes out and makes, he's also a puppet for Satan, but he's making an image to the sea beast, which essentially in reality is an image to Satan. And he's forcing people to worship it. It's absolute confusion. We find that this land beast is trying to imitate the things of God by doing tremendous, tremendous miracles, even making fire come down from heaven. It's confusion what's going on. We're going to live through these things in these days. But we must remember that we must be like Daniel. We must be like Jesus. Why is the city destroyed? Why is the city of Babylon destroyed? Because she has killed the prophets and the saints of all who were slain on the earth. Listen to this. It's, this is in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 28. Before Cyrus was even born. I mean, sometimes we wonder, you know, when I was in high school, I wondered, does God have a plan for my life? Have you ever wondered that? What does God want from me? What direction that, does God want me to go in? Have you had that lately? <laughs> I encounter it. Which direction does the Lord want our church board to go in? <laughs> God has a plan. Listen to the plan that God has for a man who wasn't even born. In Isaiah chapter 44, verse 20, it says, who says, of, who says of Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, You shall be built, and to the temple your foundation shall be laid. This is before even Babylon was destroyed, before even Babylon destroyed Jerusalem. Cyrus wasn't even born there, and yet God is prophesying about a man, and he calls him a what? calls him a shepherd. This is just a, a type of Jesus Christ. When he uses the word shepherd, Jesus calls himself in the book of John, I am the good shepherd. He's trying to call the people who were listening, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, to tell them that I am the Cyrus of the day. Just like Cyrus says that he will rebuild the temple or, and lay the foundation straight, that's what Cyrus did. This is a representation of Jesus Christ. This is a messianic prophecy. And then Isaiah 45, verse 1, it says, Thus says the Lord to the, His anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before Him and lose the armor of kings, to open before Him the double doors, so that the gates will not be shut. What's interesting is that this, this man who, um, Cyrus, who was the king of the Medes and the Persians, who overtook Babylon and overthrew it, he is the representation of Jesus Christ. Well, we're living today in what is considered or what is known as spiritual Babylon. You know, we have so many different churches out there. <laughs> it's not even funny. I could go and start my own, my own church and call it the Church of Jesus Christ is Zacchaeus Perea Jr. I could go and do that. It isn't expensive. I can just go to the state, city of Austin and tell them, hey, I'm a, I want to be an ordained minister, pay them like 25 bucks or something. They give me my license and I could start my own church. And, you know, it's, what's funny is that you go and you go to different churches, you can ask them the same question, and they will tell you all kinds of different stories. They can give you all kinds of answers, but unfortunately, most of the time, those answers do not come straight out of God's Word. That's why it's confusion. When you ask, it's kind of like the game of telephone. When you ask one person, or you whisper something in one person's ear, they're going to each give the interpretation of what they heard. But it isn't until you go directly to God's Word... That is when you know the original message. 
So what we have here is essentially where Cyrus marched into Babylon and conquered it, Jesus Christ, who is Cyrus, will also march into a spiritual Babylon and make it collapse. Just like it said there, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Jesus Christ will collapse Babylon. And why? And it says, as I heard this, I'm sorry, and I heard, as it were the voice of great multitude, as the sound of many waters and the sound of the, of the mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. You know, when, when Anna and I got married, have I told you all this story? You know, I have to, I have to ask because, <laughs> you know, this is just, you know, I'm redoing some of my sermons, and a lot of times these stories begin to run in my mind. Well, I don't, we, were, we were supposed to get married at 3.30, May 21st. And it's going to be this beautiful outdoor wedding and stuff, and everything was set up, and we thought to ourselves it'll be perfect weather. Graduation was the first weekend of, of May, and it was nice and cool. It was perfect temperature. So we thought to ourselves, if we do the wedding at 3.30 on May 21st, it should still be nice and cool. Well, it was the most stressful day of our lives. I mean, it was crazy. There were so many things that we didn't know we needed. We didn't have a knife to cut the cake. You know, I have my pocket knife. I'm sure that wouldn't fly well with the, with the pictures of the photographer. We needed to get that done. We had so many things. The lady who made our cake, our wedding cake, she lived 45 minutes away. She got sick and couldn't deliver it. Nobody else knew where she lived except for me. <laughs> so I had to go to their house with my brother. We did the rehearsal and everything. I had to drive down there 45 minutes one way with my brother and drive it back. And we had to have the AC full blast on it. My brother's already cold nature. I know a church member that's kind of cold nature. As soon as we turn on a fan, she tries to put on a blanket or something. And we had the AC blasting on it. And my brother's like, I'm so cold. I was like, suck it up. <laughs> <laughs> Where's your jacket, you know? And he had to hold that cake for 45 minutes all the way to Keene. So 3.30 comes along, you know, and the thing is that the church, the, our, our friends and people who were invited, we had tons of people there. I told Anna, and I was like, you know what? The most important thing at that wedding needs to be the food. She's like, why? I was like, well, first of all, I'm Mexican. What happens with Mexicans, if somebody finds out that there's a wedding, even if they don't know you, it's almost like as long as they can say your name, they feel like they should be able to come to your wedding. <laughs> so they'll show up to the wedding. We, have about, we had about 350, about, yeah, about 350 people show up to our wedding. We only sent out really like 50 wedding invitations. So I told her, I was like, we have to have food. That is where most of our budget will go. Because otherwise your name will live in infamy. Even those who weren't invited, they'll say, oh, what a chintzy family. <laughs> That's just how my people roll. So, so we went and 3.30 comes around and I began to see people get worried. Because that's a time when we were supposed to get married. And the bride is nowhere to be seen. But honestly, we're still decorating. <laughs> and I remember some people coming up to me and asking me, Hey, Ezekiel, are you alright? I said, yeah. Oh, okay. Are you sure you're okay? I said, What's going on? And then I clicked. They think that Anna's going to dump me at the altar. I said, no, no, no. You all don't understand. I was like, this is Anna. <laughs> all my other friends, her bridesmaids, they're like, Ezekiel, you know you're okay. I'm like, yeah, I know it's fine. They're like, you know Anna's going to be late. I'm like, yeah, I know she's going to be late. It's all right. I called her up at 3.30. I was like, hey, where are you? She's like, I'm just driving up. I said, what do you mean you're just driving up? She's like, I haven't done the flowers girl's hair. I haven't taken a bath, and I'm not ready either. I was like, are you kidding me? I was like, it's 3.30. I was like, people are waiting for you. He's like, tell them to wait. I was like, okay. I told everybody, y'all need to wait. At 5 o'clock or 5.30, she finally started riding down on the horse carriage. <laughs> and let me tell you, what was the nice, beautiful, cool weather the first weekend in May? It's all like all of a sudden God wanted to play a, a prank on us and made it real hot. It was about 90 degrees out there, 95 degrees. We had all the chairs perfectly set up in this beautiful shaded area. We got married under this big, huge elm tree. And, well, what happens with the sun? It shifts. What happens with the shadow? It also shifts. <laughs> so there's, we're standing on a platform looking this way, 
everybody had shifted this way, so <laughs> it was very awkward for photos and stuff. But when she finally was ready, they called us up. They called us up, and they told her, hey, she's coming down. And I remember, just like it was yesterday, her riding on this carriage with this huge, I guess it was a Clydesdale, this huge Clydesdale riding with her dad in the back seat. And as soon as she came up to the front, to the center of the aisle, or what the aisle that had been remade, <laughs> it was all worth it. Here we have this, this terrible picture of Babylon. This, it calls her a whore. It calls her a prostitute. I mean, Jesus doesn't hold punches. He calls the city of Babylon. He calls the spiritual condition of the people in the last days. He compares it to a prostitute. What does a prostitute do? It takes anyone. That's what happens in the last days. What happens in the last days? A lot of people will just be, accept be accepting anything to be truth. Oh, well, yeah, that sounds nice. That sounds like it could be biblical. I'll go ahead and accept that. But that's not what God calls us to do. God calls this city Babylon. And what happens? Cyrus went and conquered it. What happened with the, city, the citizens of Babylon? Were they being wise knowing that the day that they were living in, were they being wise in the fact that they knew that they were living in a spiritual warfare? They didn't care. They didn't care. And that's why it fell. But there will be people in the last days, and this is what makes me so happy. There will be people in the last days like Daniel. There will be people in the last days who will be found praying. There will be people in the last days who will know we're in a spiritual warfare. I don't want to be part of that confusion. I don't want to be part of that babbling. I want to be found righteous with God. And, you know, Jesus tells us in the parable of the ten, ten virgins that the last five virgins that actually made it to the, to the wedding, what was it? They had enough oil for their lamps. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes, they might have dozed off. But at the end of the day, they had the Holy Spirit with them. The other ones didn't prepare enough. They thought, oh, I should be fine. It's kind of like Anna's wedding, probably. <laughs> they didn't prepare Anna's wedding. And the question that we have to ask ourselves today is, what is my spiritual condition like? Am I going to be one of these people that is confused? Am I going to be one of these people that goes on living like we have the rest of our lives? Living like nothing is ever going to overtake us. Jesus isn't going to come. Are we going to live that way? Or are we going to live like Daniel? My prayer is that we live like Daniel. My prayer is that we surrender to Jesus Christ daily. And it's awesome because Jesus gave us, a, gave us signs. God didn't, Jesus didn't give us these, these prophecies to try to scare us. Jesus gave us the best directions that anyone could give. I know this isn't true, but I always tell Anna that men give better directions. I know it's not true. My aunt can give directions. I mean, it's just, it's awesome. When she's giving you directions, she's a doctor out in San Antonio. It's almost like she's painting a picture for you. And we can get to her house, but a lot of times, <laughs> I'm not trying to be sexist, but some ladies can't give directions for nothing. And they'll give you so much detail. Oh, you got to go this, da, 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 da. And a guy is usually like, you're going to get to an Exxon. Take a right there at that street. Go about four streets and take a left. Our house is the little red one on the right. And that's it. But my wife, she loves to give a lot of details. You're going to drive about 3.5 miles, and there's going to be this county road name, this and that. You need to look. Jesus gives us good directions because Jesus doesn't want anybody to get lost. Jesus doesn't want people to be, Jesus doesn't want us to be the citizens of Babylon who will fall in the last days. Jesus doesn't want us to be part of that confusion. In order to not be part of that confusion, we know, need to go directly to God's Word so that we can stand firm, so that we know exactly what the message says. We don't want to be found with the babbling people. We don't want to be found with the people trying to save themselves. We don't want to be found with the people who are mocking God like Belshazzar did. We don't want to be found with those foolish people. We want to be found with people like Daniel. We want to be found worshiping God. We want to be found having an intimate relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is the only way that we find salvation. The only way that we can 
leave Babylon or leave that confusion and step out into the light and want, be able to walk into the new Jerusalem is if we have surrendered and accepted Him as our Lord and Savior. This is what happens. It portrays this beautiful picture of this conquering king and his wife, his bride is prepared for him, prepared to, to be married to him. When Anna walked down that aisle, I remember that earlier that day, I, was, I thought I was going to lose it. I was so stressed out. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting anxiety just remembering on that day. <laughs> and my dad told me, he saw me, how frantic I was. And he grabbed me and he stopped. He's like, you need to stop. And he spoke to me very hard. And then he said, what matters is at the end of the day, Anna's going to say yes, and you're going to be married. All right, so don't worry about everything else. And I remember when I was up there looking at her, and, you know, she had her veil before her face. I remember my dad's word. I said, it's true. All of that stress... <laughs> All of that griping and complaining, it didn't matter anymore. It's not going to matter anymore. When we, when we look back, when we enter the new Jerusalem, when we get to see Jesus face to face, when we get to sing praises to God forever and ever, the things that we live through here on earth aren't going to matter anymore. Just like Daniel told Belshazzar, I don't want your, your riches. I don't want to be third in the kingdom. I don't want your purple robe. I don't want your golden chain. Essentially what Daniel was saying is, I don't want the things of this earth because I know it's going to collapse. We must also be ready to say like Belteshazzar, like Daniel said, I don't want the things of this earth because the things of this earth, they're not going to last. I want to be a citizen of heaven. How about you? Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Lord, because it is only through Him that the victory is given to us. Lord, it doesn't matter how hard we try. It doesn't matter how, how much we try to do on our own. Without Jesus Christ, we are still lost. We are still doomed. Lord, we need Him. Lord, and we are just so grateful for this beautiful passage in Revelation where you, you say to us, Come out of her, my people. Lord, you want us to come out of the confusion. We want to be found ready, Lord. We want to be citizens of the new Jerusalem, Lord. We want, to see, be, we want you to be our king. Lord, we don't want to live in this crazy world anymore. And just like Daniel was ready to say to the king, to Belshazzar, I don't want your, your riches, I don't want your position, I don't want your golden chain, I don't want the things of this earth. We also want to say to you, Lord, we don't want the things that this world offers. We want the things that you offer, which is eternal life. Lord, please come soon. May each one of us that are here present today, Lord, may each one of us be ready. May each one of us accept the Lord and Savior Jesus. May each one of us hold our head on, hold our head on high and understand and realize that we are just ambassadors here on earth, that our citizenship is in New Jerusalem. Lord, we thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, amen.